This is the Rafah crossing, the only official way to enter Gaza from Egypt. We arrived to find activists like us from the US, France, Britain and Italy who had come to see what had really happened here and to bring a message of solidarity and assistance to the Palestinian people. These activists, while staying at the border, have been kept awake by bombing raids carried out by Israeli F-16s along the border. With the growing number of activists and medical teams amassing at the border, their ability to effectively lobby from here, and with the threat that London and internationally based activists would march on the Egyptian embassy, the authorities became edgy. Eventually, without warning, we were allowed to cross the border. This is where we met Hanan Shawa, our interpreter, and other US citizens who are coming to offer their support and solidarity. Uh, my name is Tyler Westbrook, and I'm from Vermont in the United States. I'm Selena Tremel. I'm originally from Arizona and I'm living in Boston, Massachusetts right now in the U.S. And I came here due to the horrible situation in Gaza and I feel responsible as an American citizen. It is my taxpayer money that flies these F-16s that drops the, the bombs on the Palestinian people in violation of international law, in violation of the Geneva Conventions, of the Nuremberg Principles and of American law. In terms of the U.S., I think it's very important that we bear witness. Our media is very biased, it's covering a lot of the story, and we got very little um, from the mainstream media. So I'm hoping that the photos and the stories that we bring back to the U.S. will show people the reality on the ground. And, and I visited Palestine before, and I see it as a central issue to so many more. If we can work this one out, then perhaps we have a chance at dealing with other issues. And to me, I felt like I must come. I must come and I must bear witness to what's happened here and I also must document what happened here to take it back and show people in America that maybe don't know or maybe have the wrong idea. They watch the Fox News and the CNN and then and CNN and Fox News never speaks about the children and the women and the people of Palestine. They only speak of Hamas and the rockets. And then uh, everything Israel does is in defense of that. So what, what I'm trying to do as a citizen is to uh, show the truth of this situation uh, with, without it being subject to some corporation and how they want the story to come out. Uh, well, I've been here a couple of times. I first got interested in Palestine when I was a student in Egypt. Um, nine years ago and really wondering about what was going on in the Holy Land and what all of these stories were. I grew up um, in a conservative Christian family and always received a very um, Zionist kind of Israel only sort of narrative so I was interesting not only to see the places that I had read about as a child in the Bible but to also learn about the living rocks and see the story of why this place was in such great conflict. Since the withdrawal of illegal Israeli settlements from Gaza in 2005, the area has been under siege. Sealed by walls on all sides, and with Israeli gunboats patrolling the ocean, food, medicine, clothes, educational supplies, and almost every other aspect of normal life have been blocked from entering or leaving. This has led to 75% unemployment, mass poverty, and the closing down of nearly all enterprise on one of the most heavily populated areas of the planet. With Israel blocking its border to the east, and Egypt willingly accepting the task to the west, it's not just vital supplies which are kept out of Gaza. During the latest Israeli invasion, during December 2008 and January 2009, even the media were kept away from Gaza. With mainstream media outlets willingly accepting their exclusion, they resorted instead to unchallenged verbatim reports from Israeli government officials. As the director of Israel's government press office, Daniel Seaman said, Any journalist who enters Gaza becomes a fig leaf and front for the Hamas terror organization, and I see no reason why we should help that. We believe that the world has the right to see what really happened during the invasion, and what the reality of life meant to Palestinian people still imprisoned in the Gaza Strip. The Palestinian media, however, appreciated the support of activists from the UK, marking our arrival with a quick interview. Okay, uh, my name's uh, Patrick Ward. 
Um, I've come here uh, from the Stop the War movement in Britain. Um, I've come as a journalist uh, basically to record what's really going on in Gaza. Because in Britain at the moment there's been a massive movement against uh, the war. We then headed to the site of the first attack by the Israelis in this latest of their growing list of atrocities against the Palestinian people. This is the scene of the first attack of the most recent war on Gaza. On the 27th of December 2008, as many around the world celebrated Christmas and Western governments were in recess, it was graduation day at this police academy when the war planes attacked. The site was bombed repeatedly, killing 85 graduates. This ceremony for the graduation of police officers had been planned for months as had the Israeli bombardment, which led to their deaths. Behind me is the police training academy, destroyed by the Israelis during the bombing of Gaza. All around this is destruction. You can see uh, broken bricks, bits of concrete, um, um, melted and twisted wires. Whatever they've used to destroy this place, it was a massive bomb. And, uh, and we've been told about this by the Red Crescent when we arrived. The Israelis used a, a much larger weapon than anyone had seen before in Gaza. And as you can see from the devastation, it's, it's horrendous. Official documents, magazine cartridges, and unrecognizable twisted pieces of metal lie strewn across the site where children now play. The academy was not spared by the Israelis, nor, it would seem, was any aspect of civilian life, with fishing boats, markets, farm machinery, hospitals and industry all targeted. As even French President Nicolas Sarkozy said, it is an absolute humanitarian disaster. Every government building has been bombed. Okay, so we've just heard, we're uh, driving away from the site we were just at uh, because um, the Egyptians have just heard reports uh, from Israel that there is likely to be uh, an attack soon, perhaps by an F-16. Um, everyone has to get away for 300 uh, metres away from the uh, Rafa crossing at the moment um, to stay safe. So that's what we're doing. It wasn't just the basic infrastructure that was hit. The Al Jazeera Hotel was a venue where people would hold parties, they'd have weddings, uh, birthdays, that sort of thing. And as you can see behind me, this is what's left of it after the Israeli bombardment. During the Israeli invasion, bombs, missiles and tanks destroyed much of the infrastructure of Gaza. Schools, mosques, the cement factory, farms, houses, banks, government buildings, universities and even the zoo was hit. This was the Minister of the Interior, the equivalent to our British Home Office. It's where records of all births, marriages and deaths were kept in Gaza. As you can see, it's now completely destroyed. The siege from Egypt and Israel meant that getting the materials to rebuild will be near impossible. Whilst Gordon Brown committed two warships to further blockade the Gazan people, simple building materials such as cement are not being allowed in. In his book of the same name, Barish Kimmeling described the concept of politicide. This, he said, was the destruction of any aspect marking out the Palestinians as an independent social, political or economic entity. This is the Parliament building. As it stands in ruins, 36 Palestinian legislators still languish in Israeli prisons. But of course, it was not just the buildings which were destroyed. We next visited Shifa Hospital, where many of the dead and wounded were taken during the bombardment. Uh, actually, we, uh, we have very, very bad uh, memories of that these days because uh, we feel that uh, actually it was not uh, a real war, uh, it was a holocaust, a real holocaust. Uh, since I was uh, a boy, I was hearing about the holocaust, but uh, I have never imagined how it is until I have seen it here. 
it was a real holocaust. Uh, I've seen complete families burned to death by the Israelis here. So it's... Uh, we were receiving uh, huge numbers of uh, victims. All of them uh, were civilians. Uh, I, I can remember one of the uh, patients. Uh, she had four of her children, plus her husband, were burned to death in front of her eyes. And she herself came to us uh, with massive burns, uh, with her uh, daughter-in-law and granddaughter. Her granddaughter was two years old. She came with massive burns. It is not just the infrastructure which was affected. Many civilian homes were leveled with increasingly advanced and experimental weapons, having a massive toll on the innocent. We went to visit one of the families whose homes was targeted by the Israelis with horrific results. White phosphorus will burn the skin. It is banned as a weapon under the Geneva Convention. It can only be used to create a smoke screen or to illuminate an area of battlefield. Can you tell me, do you have any issues And Hamza is eight years old. She said her son, Hamza, eight years old, he, he was on fire from the white sulfurous. He stood with his finger like this saying, I'm going to pray, I want to pray, mom. And she said, okay, go ahead and pray. And all four of them died. 
ظلت شاهد معايا انا اللي هي بنت الرضيعه في حضني شاهد يعني ماتت في حضني اه ماتت هي في حضني her daughter that she was feeding a year and three months old died in her in her arms وقعدت موعد في النار شاهد صارت تقول لي ماما وتسرى في نار بتجيب فيها انا ما كنت اشوف من مره she, she said that the, bur the, the burn is burning her and she was saying, Mom, I mean, what is she? 15 months old? She told us exactly what happened. First, the house was uh, bombarded by a rocket from Israeli air jet. So part of the house was demolished. So they escaped to one of the rooms of the house. Then, after that, the Israelis uh, hit the house with white phosphorus bombs inside the house. So. Uh, her children were in flame, were burned, and uh, she started to cry, uh, help my children, save my children, they are burning, they are dying. And until she came to us here for more than a week, every time we uh, go to her room, we find her crying, help my children, help them, they are burning, they are dying. Even the psychiatrist here, did her, her best to calm her down, but psychiatrist. Yeah, she couldn't do anything to calm her. And finally, she, the psychiatrist decided to take her to the graveyard to show her the graves of her children and her husband to calm her down, to convince her that her children are dead now, are not in fire. So this was uh, only one example of what happened. So it's, uh, if, you, if you were not here, you cannot imagine how uh, the situation, how difficult it was, and how uh, these, the Israelis are unhuman, and they are, they are uh, I feel they are the new Nazis. Yusuf, Yusuf. Seventeen were in the house. And the, all there was left is a two child and her. And she got injuries. As you can see, it's on her hand and then on her foot. <laughs> هذا لما سعفونا مش بطلعنا محروقين فيش سعاد فيش يعني صليب الأحمر يدخل ممنوع منطقة عسكرية صح الشهيد اللي موت ما يطلعوش من البيت قتلوهم استشهد راه دغري اللي نسعفوا الجرحة اللي هي كيمته بنت ابن فرح وابن عمر اللي حمل شاهد بفكر شاهد يقول عشان مش اللي معايا اللي هي آخر بنت هي دي بنت بنت واحدة واستشهدت اخوتها بحبوها أخذها أخوها اللي عمره 18 سنة عمر حملها وشرد مع مرت أخوه بنت أخوه في الأتراك ما كانش عندنا سحافات الجيش اللي صايله دور خلال صاوبوا فيده وقالوا يرمي الشهيد هذا على الأتراك ضلوا مرمية البنت اللي بنت عمرها سنة طلعت شو على الأرض آه على الأرض آه ضلت على الأرض إيش 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 هادو فوقيها شحن ومن شحن تواك ومن ايش الشحن؟ ايش تواك؟ جرافة الجيش الاسرائيلي جرافة ما بعرفش ما تقول لك في معهم دبابات وجرافات الجيش الاسرائيلي احنا معنا تراك زراعة باقي الشهداء هذول جنب التراك اللي هو مطر ومحمد وبنت شهد بقى ومعهم غالي 
غدك انت وبنت ابن فرح الجيش الاسرائيلي قال لمحمد ابني ارفع وعيد وخذ الجريحه هذه ماشي واطلع فيه كيف بده يقدر يحملها هذه المرض؟ يحملها ثلاث انفار حملها صار يجوا فيها جرس وطلعت تحت رجلي يعني تطلع رجلي يطخوا تحت رجلي وضلوا ماخذ مرضه وبيجي 300 متر من عند مدرسه عمر بن الخطاب لعند العطاطره عندنا فوق على الدوار اللي بتعرفوا هذول هو عندنا مرحلتين شو هذا اللي هو جوز اولادي اخذوه بالسياره نص نقل من هان تعت بكره ابو حليمه لعند دوار العطاطره لقوه من الجيش الاسرائيلي قالوا وقفوا وقفوهم جابوا السياره وقلبوها وبالجرافه تعت الجيش الاسرائيلي وحطوا فوق الشهاده رامي هذا المرحلة الأولانية تحت أولادي أولاد سلفة دول اللي تحت كان معهم عضلنا شو هذا عندنا شو هذا فوق وشو هذا نحن إحنا لهم كلهم من عيلتنا إحنا هذول شو هذا فيهم خمسة وهذا من شهيد مطر هذه بقت ما عندنا مطر فخوه بنا قدامها هذه المطر وهي علي شايفة علي أنا بقت مسكاة أنا في النار هي هذا ابن علي اللي ظل من بقية الخطوط الصغار انحرق من هانكم Allah na jaal hai. This is the only son she has left. Actually, we, we don't have uh, experience of the white phosphorus in the past, uh, but uh, so we were dealing with the burns uh, as any burn. So we were evacuating the hospital every day because we were expecting every day to receive more victims. So we uh, used to send the uh, victims with what seems to be simple burns, send them home uh, and ask some uh, uh, NGOs, some charity organizations like uh, Physicians Without Borders to take care of them at home. But we found that most of these patients come back to us after a few days with, uh, with the burns became deep and uh, wider and some of them with bad general condition and even some of them uh, unfortunately died in spite of the small area of the burn. Some of them were just 10%, 10% of the body surface area was burned and they should not die. So we found it very strange. So we started to, uh, to discuss this with uh, our colleagues who came to help us from different countries. W what's going on? Why these patients getting uh, like this? Why they die? Uh, and some of these doctors uh, had experience uh, during the war, they worked in Lebanon, during the war in 2006, uh, and they went so these wounds they said that it's very similar to the uh, burns which result from the white phosphorus bombs. So from that point we started to manage them in a completely different way. Uh, every patient with such burns, we take him immediately to the uh, operating room and we clean the burn area and do the brightening, excise all the burn tissues and remove all the particles of the white phosphorus so and we found uh, we removed pieces of this white phosphorus and when we showed it to uh, the doctors who have experienced work they confirmed that this is the white phosphorus and we ourselves after the, at the end of the war we have seen a lot of these pieces in the streets of areas which are bombarded and I myself I brought pieces from the compound of Anorwa, which was bombarded by white phosphorus bombs, and I still keep part piece of it till now in the jar here. So it's now we are, it's 100% confirmed that it is white phosphorus bombs which cause these burns. Yes. For how long does white phosphorus continue to burn? Yeah, this is the problem. It continues to burn until all the white phosphorus piece is consumed. It, it cannot be distinguished uh, only if you prevent it, uh, oxygen uh, from it. Oh, it stinks. Yeah. You bring gloves. Blaming it still here. That's right. If I hit it, 
for a few minutes, flame will come. Okay. How long have you had it? Two months. Two months, yes. Two yes. months. So, so should, what I want to ask you is, uh, what if this stuff is still on the ground where they hit it? Oh, it was a deep burns. Many children came to us after the war with burns on their feet. Because they walk on the, uh, on these pieces, because it's burned even through the shoes. Because it burned to the shoes and burned to their feet. That's why I can I keep it here now in a jar tightly closed. So it's uh, that's why it, it, it causes very deep burns. Uh, and some of them could burn down to bone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I can remember uh, one of the patients, we were cleaning his burns in the operating room. Uh, a piece, small piece of the white phosphorus jumped from the, uh, from the wound and hit the chest of the anesthetist. So it was burn for the, the doctor, the anesthetist. Just hit for for seconds, and I have his picture. I can show yes, his yes. picture now. So it's. Uh, Is the doctor okay? He's okay. He's okay. Yes, but uh, you can imagine if this hit his chest for a second, it could burn for his chest. So, so it's also dangerous to operate on as a doctor or to treat as a doctor. Th that's right, that's right, because uh, we have to, to wear double gloves, we have to, even the mask, it has a very bad odor. Uh -huh. This uh, white pistol has very bad odor, uh, and I'm afraid that it's, uh, it's not only white phosphorus, because uh, when I uh, asked the, our colleagues who had experience and when I went to, through the, uh, uh, the text box, I found that the, the white fossil doesn't have this uh, very offensive odor. So uh, there is uh, doubt that they use some kind of, other, some chemical, kind of some other chemicals in it, yes. That's why uh, many of, of, of my colleagues, the, the doctors here and the nurses even, are worried about this and keep asking me, uh, is it dangerous for us to, to smell this? It only takes a small amount of white phosphorus to land on you to cause a slow and agonizing death. In these photos, you can see how once the injury begins to burn, that it burrows deep inside the skin and will continue to burn and combust within the body. During the conflict, white phosphorus rained down in large amounts over schools, hospitals and residential areas. The United Nations was also targeted resulting in the destruction of many tons of food aid waiting to be distributed. Uh, and the families of the, of the patients as well keep asking me, what's this bad odor? And what's the long-term complications? Is this any complications? Uh, to, to be honest, I tell them, I don't know. Because I don't know exactly what, what exactly the weapon, the type of weapon used. Mm. Is it just quite fast for us or not? I don't know. And uh, this actually, Made me keep asking the, the, the international community, the international organizations, to send teams of weapon experts. I, I asked many times during the war and after the, the end of the war that they should send teams of experts in weapons to investigate and tell us what types of weapons have been used against us, to know what types of injuries we are dealing with. Um. Do you, have they sent weapons experts? No? Uh, actually, the Amnesty International mm. sent teams, but unfortunately, uh, when they came here, and I asked two of them to introduce themselves as weapons experts, I asked them, do you have any equipment to investigate these things? They said no. So, I don't know, are they coming to, to prove or to negate that the, if, if, the, if he's a, a weapon expert, he should have uh, some uh, equipment to test. Because from the, the simple uh, knowledge which I have, that you, 
but a simple equipment, the, the Geiger counter, mm -hmm. you can test the level of radiation because there is many reports that Israelis use depleted uranium here in Gaza during the war. And even some places they used active uranium. How can they find out without using uh, an equipment? So I feel that they are not serious about well, this, these uh, teams which, which came to us. Uh, and I actually, I myself, I'm very, very worried about this because uh, we have a lot of complaints from many patients uh, of different strange symptoms. I myself, my, my kids, during the, the war, uh, they went down to, to the garden to pick up some oranges from the garden. Uh, my young kid, he's about seven years old, he came crying because he feels severe itching in his eyes and his throat, burning sensation in the throat. And for about 10 or 15 minutes, he kept crying and I washed him very well. That. Until now, I don't know what's going on. I think weapon experts should come here on the on the field to investigate, to test the level of radiation. We have some of the uh, uh, remnants of the uh, of the rockets themselves still uh, uh, still here, so they can investigate these things. I, I these bomb fragments were collected from around the Gaza Strip. The majority of them are marked as having been made in the United States. They often carry warnings about their transportation within the United States and the penalties for improper transportation. There was apparently less concern from the US authorities about them being dropped on Palestinian civilians. 95% of Israel's weaponry comes direct from the US. The majority of the remaining 5% comes from the European Union. It is estimated that the United States has given Israel a total of up to $114 billion in aid since 1949. You may note that our camera also picks up a strong crackling sound when around certain bomb and missile fragments in this display. This could be a possible indicator of radioactive material. These weapons include the Hellfire AGM-114F, a guided missile specifically developed to pierce armour-plated tanks. It is hard to think why the Israelis fired this weapon when the Palestinians have no armoured vehicles to defend themselves. Firing just one of these missiles costs $65,000. We have some, they, they have uh, in the hospital, they made some like a exhibition, uh, exhibition. Yeah, and they uh, put these uh, rockets and, and some of the rockets were not, didn't explode even. Still there, yes. and we have the, the serial numbers in it, we have the, uh, and uh, all of it, almost all of it made in USA, American really? yes, yes. yes. So we feel that we are like guinea pigs and the Israelis are using different types of American weapons on us.
They bombarded many places several times. Uh, uh, and I fear that it's for uh, not only to hide the evidence, but to, to kill more people. Because people sometimes feel safe to, uh, to go back to the places which already bombarded. This to make people feel that, that there is no safe place. I myself, I, I, I didn't feel that there was any safe place. Every night I, I was leaving the hospital at night. I didn't expect to come back in the morning to stay alive for the following morning. In my house, when I go home, every night I take my kids and we sleep under the stairs, presuming that it might be safer than sleeping in our beds. And every time we hear the jets or the bombardment, I feel that one of them might hit our house. Because it happened and many of our colleagues were injured or killed mm. and uh, I think they, there is no uh, no justification at all because they have uh, as they say they have the sophisticated uh, instruments uh, to, uh, to 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 target the, the their targets exactly then uh, why they had they have these civilian areas and kill civilians. If they know, then they, they are aiming the civilians, this means. So it's... Uh, I think it's, it's very easy, very easy to, uh, to take these people to the war crime uh, court because the evidence is very clear, very clear that they were uh, targeting civilians there, there was no limits at all to what they are doing, at all. I, as a doctor here, I have never seen any militants here in the hospital. Mm -hmm. All the, the, the victims were civilians. More than 50, 45 percent of them are women and children. So it's... Uh, I feel it's the, the world, all the world, uh, is helping the Israelis in this crime, participate in this crime. Because for 22 days to let the Israelis bombard us and kill our people and demolish the houses on the heads of the inhabitants and no single government put any pressure on the Israelis to stop this massacre. So it's, we feel that we, we, we are very, our lives and our blood is very cheap. Because I'm sure if we were just a group of, of sheep or goats bombarded for 22 days, these Western governments will put pressure on the Israelis to stop bombarding these goats. But we feel that our blood and our people are cheaper than goats and sheep. In what was once the village of Zaytun, 48 members of the Samuni family were killed by Israeli soldiers on the 5th of January 2009. This is actually their home right now. When I came up here, they were having dinner and their dinner is actually lettuce. Um, and their two of their kids are taking a nap underneath that little tarp. You can see their feet so the, the flies don't come on them. And she has a little baby infant in her hand. So what we're going to do is discuss and ask them what really happened فاجت هنا على بيت اخويا الصبح بدري هيك على الساعه 6 6:30 اللي هم رموا عليهم ثلاث جزائر ايش الجزائر 
سعيد مرموه ومش عارفين عاد مين اللي مات مات والإصابة كليتهم اللي طلعوا معانا إحنا لما نطلعنا إحنا ذات نفسنا قاعدنا نتفقد في حالنا يعني إحنا ما ما توقعناش إننا نطلع صراحة ما توقعناش نهائي إننا نطلع يعني طول وإحنا طالعين نتفقد في حالنا فينا إصابة مش فينا إصابة بس أغلب أصواتي يعني بقى اوكي اكثر من واحد طلع من البيت لا عادي اكثر من واحد طلع من البيت والله يمكن بدي اقول لك فوق ال 20 150 لا ما هو غير اللي شردوا يعني غير اللي شردوا انت قلتي قديش كان في البيت هنا هنا يعني بيجي اوكي سو كلهم يعني مين قديش اللي مات من البيت اللي ماتوا كانه 30 واحد 32 زي هيك اللي ماتوا عنا هان اوكي فور تو ييرز ناو Nothing is allowed to come in. Even food, even food is not allowed to come in. It's very ironical that the Egyptians declare, many times declare that they found some smugglers, they smuggle food through the tunnels. Smuggling food. Because people don't find food, don't have food here. So only during the war, from the second week of the, the war, the border was opened, Egyptian border, and mid, uh, uh, the AIDS started to, to come in. We had many equipment here are broken and we needed spare parts. And we couldn't find this, bring these spare parts for two years. Only after the, the war, when the, the border was opened, we, we could bring these spare parts. And we had uh, most of the medications which, which we needed we brought it, we had it now. Mm -hmm. But uh, because of the siege, we don't know. Because these uh, supplies uh, <laughs> might, might finish, might be consumed in, in weeks or in, in a, few, uh, a few weeks. And the siege is, is still there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the siege is uh, very dangerous. It's not less uh, dangerous than the war. <laughs> Because people are dying because of the siege. I myself, my mother, she had cancer lung and she needed radiation, radiotherapy. And we, have, we don't have radiotherapy here in Gaza. So she had to go to Egypt or to Jerusalem. And for more than two, two months, we were waiting for the permit from the Israelis or from the Egyptians to go for, for treatment. And she died after two months without getting this permit. And you can imagine how many people like her like this. We came to the house and 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 we came to the house. بس ما توقعتش انها تكون متوفى في نفس البيت، انا قلت يمكن مغمى عليها شيء بس اجى منه زيها شظايا من القنبله هاي، زيها شظايا هنا بصفتها يا عيني ترى. كلمي يا اخوانا. وإلي برضه اخويا برضه توفت وبنتها وبنتها الكبيرة وبرضه ايش بدي احكي لك هنا اولاد اخويا اللي هم اولاد هذه. عندها اه نفرين هنا ولد وبنت راحوا لها وعندها ثلاث انفار برضه برا متصوبين. جوزها. You yourself can imagine one million people living in a big prison. Yeah. In a big prison, nothing is allowed to come in and no one is allowed to go out. I myself, I had many, many invitations for medical conferences and of course I couldn't go because of this siege. Yes, from the first day, they tell, tell the people to come inside this house. And around about 100 people, person come here. They, they are stay for one day inside this house. They become hungry, they want to food, so that the three person go out from this house inside these around houses to bring food to eat, the children to eat. So that when they return back, the occupation destroyed the home above them. So that about 20 people, 20 persons killed here and about 15 children killed inside this house. They stay for here four days without any water, any food, anything. And there are many killed. And also above the, the people that killed about 20 also injured. The 20 
all of them, most of them are, are children. So that the Red Cross come b before, after uh, four days and take this uh, uh, injured people and leave the kill because they haven't any cars to bring so that they carry him in, to, in the hand and bring them to far, far uh, distance. Okay, you know, so that the kill people uh, left them here and after 15 days they come and take the kill people, they find them under the salt under uh, the oh. sand and the rocks here. They put the rocks and the sand because they uh, hate the smell that go out from the people that did. You know, that's what happened inside this this uh, house. And around this house, there are also eight people killed here and here and here. That the area killed here about 28 <laughs> persons. This is what happened in this house. So that they destroy all the small houses that every house have about 20 to 30 uh, person inside it so that we can find thousands of people here are without houses that's what happened and the people you want to know that are farmers they didn't have any uh, military uh, uh, doings you know so the you know, symbol they are symbol they plant the grass and here and they, you can find the uh, orange, lemon, uh, tomatoes, this, this, they are here, um, oh. simple people. How it many? Can't, you can't see this man, it uh, work as a farmer. Look at him, he injured and stay here for four days without any food, any water. Like these children oh. stay here for four, do four days without eating, without food, without nothing. Absolutely, for the last three years, I haven't been allowed to go outside, outside Gaza. Not myself only, all the people, one and a half million people here, are not allowed to go outside Gaza. And when they shouting the fire to them, they become to go out with crying, uh, yes, you can know the, the situation. You fire, bombing, yes, explosions. Yo, the, the, the people come uh, hurry and they uh, walk uh, quickly from here and they walk about two kilo from here to find uh, the nearest car to go to the hospital. This is what happened here. You, can, uh, you cannot imagine the, the situation. Yes. To them. So did Israeli tanks and soldiers come through? Yes, yeah, soldiers, woken soldiers and tanks and this. The, this by house what? by bulldozer. Yes, you can see uh, this. Not explosion. Bulldozer. So they bulldoze. Ah, this yes. Area. They yes. the area. Yes, yes. Bulldozer. And the mosque here are destroyed also. With they destroyed the mosque. General, general yes, you can see, you can go now to the mosque. Yes, Why? the mosque. We don't know the mosque doing something. It's a place for praying. Yeah. Just only. The Israelis are terrorists. They are a ter no, they are, this is not a, a government. They are a group of terrorists and they, they should not, they should stop supporting it. Because I know all the way, or most of the Western governments support Israeli government. I know the people, the Western people, it changed their the point of view now. After this war, I have seen many demonstrations all around the world against the Israeli aggression here. Yeah. But the, the governments, the Western governments, should stop supporting these, the Israelis. Because they are the occupiers, they are the aggressors. They are killing children, they are killing women. We have nothing to do with the Israeli Holocaust, with the Jewish Holocaust by the Nazis. Why the Israelis are doing Holocaust for us, for our people? We are victims. So it's, it's, it's not acceptable. Now we are in, in, in 2009 and about 7,000 civilians, Palestinians have been killed and injured during that war. And all the world are watching us as if they, they are watching just a movie. It's, 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 it's not acceptable. We are asking just for freedom. We want to live in peace. We want to live in our own houses, own homes. We are not 
uh, attacking others. People here, the majority of people in Gaza are living in refugee camps. And people maybe outside, they don't know what, what, what does it mean by refugee camps. Refugee camps that means that people were pushed out of their own houses in what is, what's called now Israel. Jaffa, Haifa, Beer Sheba, all of it was Palestinian, Arab, Arab cities. The people, the Arab people, the Palestinians were deported and pushed out of their houses and are living in refugee camps now waiting the time to go back to their houses. And some of them even have, still have the keys of their houses and the, the father before he dies, give it to his son or his grandson, tell him, this is the key of our house in Jaffa or in Haifa. Someday, we have to go back to our house there. But the Israelis are coming from very far areas. They came from Russia, from the United States, from Poland, and settled in our houses. You imagine yourself, when you go back to your house in London or in, in, in New York, Find a foreigner, some a thief, living in your own house and push you out and let you live in a refugee camp. Yeah. Then you, all the world will say that you are terrorist because you are fighting this thief. This is what happens. This is what happens. But in Gaza, of course, there are many, many people, yeah. one and a half million people. Yeah. So the farming is very important to create yes, food. Yes, it's the agriculture here in Gaza. It's the main thing for the people. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can. See. Oh, I tell you, I am as I work as a teacher in the school, and before, after I come to, from the school, I work as a farmer. Uh -huh. Yes, we all. I say, I think that most of the people uh, work as a farmer because after the sea around God's Strip, they didn't find uh, such as uh, the farmer to, uh, to uh, the, the farming to work. They cannot find industry, trade, n nothing. Do you think that, um, that, that they deliberately destroyed the farms and the olive trees and yes, the chicken yes. coops? You can see all of the trees that what about you, uh, around uh, 200 years saw, yeah. inside the land. Yeah. That's our... Uh, I have uh, a land here next to you. That's my home. You can see it from here, next uh, here. But, uh, cut the trees from the, the roots. Why? You, the tree is doing thing? No, the tree don't uh, do thing. This is uh, we can't find the, uh, why they do that. We so ask ourselves why do they do that? So you are under siege in Gaza. Yes. And you need to grow your own food because yes. you can't bring food in. Yeah. And so the Israelis destroy the food. Yes, this because the the, the the farm is the main thing. We come to the Gaza Strip. They want to destroy it, uh -huh. so that the Palestinians, the Palestinians in Gaza Strip, didn't find any thing to eat. Uh -huh. Industry, no industry, no trade, no farming, no life. Yes, you know, killing. No industry, no trade, no farming. The life without, they become without life. They will go to the border and they will kill them. You know, they didn't have any solution. The Israelis, okay, the Israelis, they are, they are our enemy. They are the aggressor, they are the occupiers. We expect the worst from them. But the Egyptians to close the borders, to help in this siege, it's, we cannot ex find any explanation. We, we, we cannot understand why we do this. We just want our freedom. We don't need any help. We don't need them to send us aids. We don't need them to send any food or medication. Just give us our freedom and our people can work and can manage our victims by ourselves. We can do it by ourselves. Just give us our freedom. Lift the siege.